Hello, everyone, and welcome to another Tea Tuesday. I am Jerome Braggs, the host of this series, which is a series where we really talk about healing our issues around sex and sexuality. So today, I cannot wait to give you this tea um, because I have a very special guest today. I'm not just going to be speaking myself today. I'm going to be speaking with someone. And my guest today is Craig Washington. Craig is, I'll let him introduce himself here in a second, but I, I, I wanna say, I wanted to talk to Craig on this particular series because he wrote an article um, recently called Freeing Ourselves of Sexual Shame and Conflicting Attitudes. No, that's not what your thing was called, excuse me. It was called Giving and Getting Some, Reflecting on the Penetration of Our Manhood and My Ass. And I don't know if you've ever read something that just hits you in the center of your chest. Like when you read it, there's so much truth or there's so much um, just you ahas and there's, you just know that this thing was written for you and probably from a piece of you, maybe a piece of your higher self writ, wrote this through Craig for you. Um, that's how I felt when I read this piece. And also as a healer that has done healing work with people around the world, um, I've known that one of the biggest issues that we face as humanity period, but especially as um, men and especially as black men is issues around sexuality and not just who we're attracted to, but how we actually have sex with them like our actual sexual practice. And this article just was just lighting up all the pieces around like, what are the things that we need to look at when we are looking at healing ourselves and the issues and the wounds we have around our sexuality. So I said, I gotta get Craig, I gotta get Craig. I gotta get Craig here. I gotta have a conversation with him face to face about this article and some of the concepts he brought up in this article. Um, so, I just, I'm just so excited to be here. So we're gonna have a conversation today about healing sexual shame and our negative attitudes around bottoming. But before I get all that in, I just wanna introduce and say thank you, um, introduce you to Craig and say thank you, Craig, for being here. So Craig, if you can, just tell us just a little bit about who you are. Oh, thank you, Jerome. First of all, thank you. And uh, it's an honor to be here. Uh, I am a fairly recent um, admirer and appreciator of the work that you do. Um, so um, I am a writer and also a therapist. I'm a social worker. Um, I've been writing, uh, well, forever. <laughs> Uh, and most of my writing uh, is focused upon the concerns, experiences, um, vision, uh, needs of Black queer men. I write about other people um, uh, and certainly those who love and uh, support um, Black, gay, same gender, same sex attracted men. Um, but that's my 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 focal point um unapologetically so um and uh i have been living with hiv i'm openly hiv positive and my experience with uh hiv has uh, informed a good deal of my walk um, my vision and my sense of possibilities um so i'm just happy to be here, of course. And, and I'm so glad that you found this particular article uh, useful for you. That's, oh, what it's, that's what it's for. I mean, I, I, want, I want people to, to get something out of it, whether it's what I intended for them to get or understand or based on their own understanding and appreciation. Yeah, I think I definitely got something out of this, as you're gonna see, because I'm literally just gonna go <laughs> <laughs> through the pieces of your article that spoke to me and say, hey, let's talk about this. But I think 
what you do in this, what you've done in this article is, which is, I think, from my perspective, I believe our greatest medicine is when we share the truth of our stories and when we share the things that we've had to heal from and how we healed them. I think that is our greatest, our greatest offering to the planet. Like, yes, we offer, we create services and products and things like that. But I think the thing that actually makes the most impact is when we say, this is how I learned to have a better life. Mm -hmm. This is how I learned to, to be more whole. And so <clears throat> this definitely, this article definitely did that. And so I'm gonna jump right in because you posed this question in your article, when I came to this question in the article, I just it just floored me. I was like, again, yes, <laughs> just ah. Uh. And you posed this question, and you said, "Could bottoming be considered a revolutionary act for self-affirming black men?" So I want to ask you, just because when I read this, I was like, "Oh, he's going here. Like, <laughs> oh, he's he's really." This brother is really trying to go here with this. So could you talk to me? Because you, because literally the whole article to me is literally, this is the umbrella piece. And the, like the mm -hmm. article just falls up underneath that. So could you talk to me a little bit about your perspective with that and your journey to this? Like mm -hmm. how did you, how did Craig himself come to even this thought or this belief that mm -hmm. bottoming could be the revolutionary act for black men. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Um, well, let me, let me just say that, you know, uh, you had mentioned earlier about um, mining from one's experience and sharing one's story to help inspire and enlighten. And so uh, for me, uh, my own path toward, which is unending, I'm still working on that uh, based on the conversation we had earlier. I just shared with you some struggles that are still, you know, I still um, retain, still um, occasionally mired in. Um, an important part, an essential part of my uh, growth and my evolution and the gift of me giving myself permission to be myself, to fully become myself, had to do with um, my, own relationship, uh, my own relationship to my sexuality, uh, my own uh, owning and own way of recognizing the significance to me. Uh, in a very personal way. Uh, that being said, um, as just a you know a black man, period, as a, as, a, as a human being, particularly as a black person who uh, is trained, whose shame is cultivated by all kinds of forces, overlapping forces, mm -hmm. and then in addition to being a, a young queer black man in the '80s, uh, before and after the onset of the AIDS epidemic. Um, there are my, uh, my experience, my early sexual experience was a part of just my own, again, uh, assertion of self, um, the way in which I first, uh, found myself or experienced being attractive or being desired was not, I didn't, I didn't have a sense of that until I was in a liberated space club and social spaces with other black gay men, um, particularly in terms of my uh, sexual experience and bottoming. It comes from a place, the lessons were, I have this experience and I shared that in the article and in, in the piece at the beginning. I have this experience, this enjoyable, pleasurable experience, um, the experience of connecting, of uh, having this you know, unprecedented event <laughs> um, and being penetrated, which was risky, which you know, I had some anxiety about and I enjoyed it. And that the conversation that ensued after 
uh, it it showed me that once again, this is another way in which um, who I am and what I enjoy and my expression is subject to some form of scrutiny, limitation, um, that it is uh, suspect, it is not good enough. And this is by someone um, who shared that experience, the, 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 my friend who was the first person who, who fucked me, who, with whom I was penetrated. Um, and so it, I was fairly young. Um, and I don't know how sophisticated my analysis was around internalized, the workings of internalized racism and homophobia, but I knew enough to know that it just, it didn't quite fit my sensibility. It didn't quite fit that, um, that, that act, just me being penetrated, it had to be somehow balanced by becoming the penetrator. Um, and so what I would come to learn is by continuing to enjoy and to value my joy, value my pleasure as is, as long as I'm not hurting anybody, you know, value the, the, the goodness and the, the, the power of, um, of my sexuality and sexual engagement with other brothers. And in context, in the context of um, get mutual pleasuring, support, intimacy, that there was, that was part of my path. And I didn't want to ignore that. I didn't want to uh, somehow subordinate that to um, just a, a, a purely or a largely intellectual understanding of what it means to be free. Mm -hmm. um, I will come to learn through my experience that my liberation was a, also about practicing my own agency, my own uh, God-given right to control, to determine what I do with my body and in sharing that with others. Uh, and so for me, there was something, there was something personally revolutionary in that. I do believe that due to, again, um, these beliefs about who we're supposed to be as men, um, that we're supposed to, uh, this, this ideal of masculinity that's imposed upon us, it's imposed upon all men, imposed upon all people really, in terms of we, women obviously, um, just to, uh, suffer from this imposition of uh, um, patriarchal dictates about, if you have this set of genitalia, then you're supposed to act in this way. You're So, and I stress we're constantly frees one from those constrictions. Oh. I'm losing you a little bit. Could you could you repeat that last sentence? Because you broke up a little bit. Okay, I'm sorry. Okay. Um, we live under these impositions, these cultural, political, and commercial, uh, commercially driven impositions of ideals about who we're supposed to be who we're, we're compelled to be, um, trained from, from birth and childhood, right? Um, that, uh, and, our, and uh, it's often our families of origin that enforce this, who we're supposed to be and who we're not supposed to be, what ways of being and behaviors and practices are prohibited. That's largely how we even learn how to be a boy or a man is by learning that you know, you're not supposed to be you, the antithesis of woman, um, all that. <clears throat> um, in terms of uh, bottoming, that is an act that is considered, again, it's associated with being a woman. That's a woman's role by patriarchal uh, practices of, or doctrine. Um, that being said, um, I knew that and I knew that in order to free myself and to fully enjoy that and to just continue to be, to, to, to work further around or through the path of accepting myself and being okay with who I am was wrestling with that piece, resisting 
some sense of shame or self-consciousness for not only bottoming, but um, being ashamed of it, being embarrassed, um, uh, somehow buying into the notion that this makes me less than. So I did, I was intentionally in a way embracing it. Um, and I also was conscious around uh, enjoying topping, you know, enjoying penetrating uh, men and, and enjoying other sexual expressions, uh, but not needing to assert that, oh yes, well, I, I top too, as a way of balancing that, as a way of compensating for some sort of uh, subtraction of masculinity. There's a, there's a mathematical way in which we deal with this, you know, these, this, this, um, these kinds of compensations that we negotiate to be okay. Um, Cause where I want to get to at, at 61 or where I am continuing to, to grow in is to really live as and incorporate the belief that I'm okay. I am enough. Who I am is enough. Um, when I talk about bottoming as a revolutionary act for black gay men, what I mean is that to the extent and in the consciousness that um, bottoming is a form of resisting uh, that, you know, those, uh, that, that, those patriarchal constraints, resisting uh, the messages that say who we are is uh, prefer perverse or unmanly or unacceptable, freeing ourselves up from that. That's one, um, by enjoying it and by it being the self-legitimizing, self-determining. Uh, also, it is um, not so much the act itself. I don't believe that a sexual act in and of itself is revolutionary. It's in the context of its, 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 its meaning, its function. And as a portal, so to speak, of connection, um, as a way of expressing uh, affection, um, mutual exchange of pleasure and connecting. Um, it's, an, it's a language. And when that language is used in the service of connection and affirmation, um, and, and when that language is used um, to, to exemplify the casting off of shame, yeah, I'm getting into it, and, I, and there's no shame in this zone, um, then we are telling ourselves, you know, who, myself and whoever else, or whoever others, more than one, um, that I'm being, being engaged in. It also facilitates, I look back on the, the, the course of my life and the friendships that, that have, that started um, through sexual attraction or some mutual attraction, right? And whether or not um, those friendships, those connections remain sexual and most of them shifted to a non-sexual, um, but certainly no less intimate, socially, physically intimate uh, connections, um, that sex uh, facilitated that. And so to the extent that, again, um, our sex, our sexuality facilitates that affirmation, that connection, um, yes, it is revolutionary. It can be revolutionary. Mm. You it can up, be. You brought up so much. I think, I think you're spot on with it. And I mm -hmm. wanna say, I wanna speak to a few things with you about this because mm -hmm. even as you were speaking, it brought this even clearer to me. I had planned to speak to you about this, but as you're speaking, it, it, was, it became even clearer to me. So there is a lot of, as a Black St. Gender Loving man myself, I have gone through um, my personal journey with shame and my sexuality and my sex. But also as a healer, I've helped many men with their, with their thing. And what I've, and many people with shame, period, that's kind of one of my my things I've worked with people and loving themselves and loving ourselves is the medicine for shame. Mm -hmm. And what I have come, cause it, you said something that is, I just wanna highlight cause I think this is the key here. Um, you were talking about um, our socialization 
around thinking about bottoming as something feminine. Mm -hmm. And there's another piece to this because they, they're hand in hand with this that I've become aware of in my own journey um, that I got to later. Like you said before, I didn't have the languaging and the understanding around this before. I knew that I had some shame around my own experiences with being penetrated before. Um, again, there was no shame in penetrating like in the in the in the engagements of penetrating somebody else that allowed me to still feel like I was still in my manhood a bit um but when I was being penetrated even though I enjoyed the experience there was also this internal shame that was there is something wrong with this was something wrong with me for doing this and the wrong with me part is again because we're associating this with being feminine and feminine, therefore, must be wrong. And there is yeah. something, but this is the thing that I got that really, again, made, was, became very clear for me as I understand the energy and the metaphysics of things now. Bottoming, the act of bottoming and the energy of femininity is actually about receiving, right? When we are topping somebody, we are giving to them. But when we are bottoming, we are receiving. And we as a culture, and especially as men, and especially as Black men, have been very socialized out of believing we are worthy of receiving. Mm. We have been very, very, very socialized and to believe our, our worth is about how much we give how much we give out right and so sex is just another I believe the way you do one thing is the way you do everything because everything is involved in your spirit is involved in everything so sex is just another part another aspect of how your internal world is playing out so we have this we have been socialized to believe I mean it's it's in our language everywhere it's better to give than it is to receive right mm -hmm. you never look at the person who is receiving as worthy it is mm -hmm. the person who is giving mm -hmm. that is the worthy being mm -hmm. and so in this sexual act here we go again playing out this same shame around how mm -hmm. dare you get pleasure and experience worth by receiving you can and, and you said this in the article in your very in the very first paragraph where you were talking about your sexual your first sexual experience with the guy mm -hmm. and he comes and you say wow he's like you why you enjoyed that you're like yeah i really enjoyed that and he was like well you better be sure if you're gonna do this you gotta also do this because you better balance it out because you can't go through life mm -hmm. receiving you gotta give right and that was a big <laughs> That was a big aha to me. It's like, no, because this is this is a thing that I have been learning in my journey. And this is probably what my big chapter is for my own life now. And what I've been, if anyone has been following my teachings, it's heavy in my teachings at the moment. Mm -hmm. Is like you deserve to receive. Mm. You deserve I had, that's good for me. I had I had I hadn't thought about it in that particular way. Um and yeah, I think there's so many, there's several um axes along which, you know, that, uh, that um, plays itself out. Um, I do think that um, when we talk about, you know, we use this, that big word patriarchy. And um, I do believe that at root, uh, patriarchy entails the agenda and all the, the 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 forms of oppression, the seemingly distinct forms of oppression um, that are connected to that, if if uh, patriarchy is the, is a tap, so to speak, it has a specific agenda around domination and control. It's about control, hmm. you know. It's about rule, and so if you then enforce that rule, not only uh, through you know, brute force, but also through culture, um, systems of belief and, in, and indoctrination, uh, thereby, you know, it's not questioned. Um, it lowers resistance because people are trained to, to comply with it. 
Um, and so one of the ways in which that is is been enforced over the uh, centuries um, is enforcing the belief that women are um, subordinate uh, and less than, and thus their subjugation is justified. Uh, and so some there's a there's a very we don't speak to it enough, but there's a very um, uh, woman hating misogynistic and certainly in terms of uh, black women misogynoir. Um, uh, and I love that distinction because there's a there's a there's a form of uh, black women or hatred and uh, fear of black women power that needs a name. Mm -hmm. um, and so the way that we uh, are trained in that in that doctrine is just in terms of just childhood, you know, is growing up. Um, what are the ways in which we are we tend to be just have a sense of who we're supposed to be, what our assignment, what our gender assignment is, and and by that I mean just how our our behaviors um, is by what is what is associated with girls and women is prohibited. Um, don't cry, don't cry, you act like a girl, you throw like a girl, you do this like a girl, girls do this. Uh, and so we learn, even though regardless of our sexual orientation or however our sexuality, and even that is so much more fluid than <laughs> these lines of identity would uh, suggest, um, we all suffer from it. And we're all, um, uh, limited by those constraints. Um, so uh, yeah, at the point where I have the wherewithal, and part of that was because I couldn't, I couldn't live, I knew that I couldn't continue to live in fear in the closet. I am 20, living with uh, my parents uh, at that point. Um, When my father asked me, are you a faggot? And I rolled my neck because I demanded in that, that, that unmistakable gesture, first time I ever defied my father, that I, I want you to give me the respect to reframe that question. You can do whatever you need to do, but I'm not going to ask that question. So I rolled my neck and he said, okay, are you a homosexual? So he knew. <laughs> with the nonverbal uh, what I was demanding. Um, in that moment, that was uh, life-giving for me, but it was just the beginning. Because in that same interaction where my father is saying that, oh, how could you be this way? We need to take you to therapy. And I'm saying, well, you need to go to therapy. You're the one who, who has the problem. I don't have the maturity to understand this man who was born in uh, Leeds, Alabama, 1935, has no idea of how to reckon with a gay son and what that means for him and all that's been taught to him, to, taught him about being a man, all that he knows about and what he wants for, what he longs for, for his son. He has no, no vision of any kind of normality or you know or, or any kind of any normalcy or healthy future for his child being that way. I don't know that. All I see is anger and opposition to who I'm trying to be. So my stance was very confrontational. And in that same encounter, uh, there's a point where it gets kind of it gets heated. And so I turn to my brother and I say, Kenny, I, um, my older brother, I got to get out here. And we go, we walk. One of the, there's a couple of things that I remember about that walk down the block, down 219th Street in Cambria Heights. One was, he told me that he loved me. He reminded me that he loved me. And the other was, I assured him, I said, Kenny, I just want you to know that I don't wear uh, dresses. I'm not like that. Because even as I am, right? So you, you, you feel me? Even as I'm drawing a line in the sand, I'm still holding on to some vestige of assimilation. I may be this, but I'm not that. And I think that's where a lot of black queer men get stuck, is in that place of approximating normalcy. You know? And so it is not enough simply to declare, what does it mean? 
it, how freeing is it to declare oneself as gay or even openly identify or come out that term, which is often misleading, you know, suggesting uh, you're imparting previously unknown information as opposed to just putting the conversation on the table, right? Um, is, it, is that enough to um, have, you know, engage in community, to be able to go to uh, the, the club and have one's gay life, so to speak, or social life, if one is still, if it's still important for, for one to seek uh, being seen, being regarded as still a man, as still holding on to some remnant of what is considered acceptable, acceptable manhood. Now, what that means for me is not that necessarily I have to be as femme as I can, or sort of to, to, to run, you know, not to run, but to, you know, to, to polarize myself from that as much as it is hmm, to, to free myself up to just be and, and to not limit myself by those lines um, and to embrace the femme that's in me, that's in all of us. Um, and so that took, that took work. You know, I had friends that were uh, a critical part of my formation, my early socialization, uh, that checked me around when my, when my internalized homophobia would express itself. You know, they would challenge me. And I do believe it's, it's um, friends like Derek um, and, and Sandra um, who helped me to, to, to nudge me to continue that constant self-challenging when you when you when you experience it when you see yourself doing it resist it or at least reckon with it even if you're not at a place of right of countering and I'm wearing this shirt intentionally counter the narrative um, because I think that our healing uh, demands it that we counter the narrative this is from the counter narrative project. Um, an amazing national organization founded by a dear friend of mine, Charles Stevens. Um, but so much of our healing and our healing about sexual shame means countering the narrative about our, our sexuality. Um, I just want to say this, uh, you know, I was, I knew there was a reason why I, I needed to, to see it, even though it was painful. Um, just recently, and in anticipation of this conversation, I'm on social media, and this is a typical conversation, Jerome. Uh, there's a, a picture of a, a, it's the back of a car with a tag, and it says, and the, and the tag reads, license plates read, mask top, M-A-S-C-T-O-P. And there was Kiki on the thread about, oh, who is this only in Atlanta? And this was an Atlanta plate. Uh, but the comments, the um, assumptions that there were several assumptions that this person's not a real top. One person even said he is verse at best, verse at best. So that suggests a, a hierarchy, a scale, right? In which bottom is at the low end of that scale versus a little high, verse at best. And what direction is that going to? So you know, there's so much in that one statement, <laughs> right? Um, that again is an indication of the kinds of things that we have to heal from. Um, so yes, it's um, our resistance and our healing depends upon that. I love that you brought this up, this concept of, um, we, we often think as same gender loving men in our journeys that your liberation begins and ends. Like it is the ending point. You are fully liberated when you just come out. Yeah. And there's, there's liber you have to liberate yourself because what you'll find is all the different places you're in bondage still. Mm -hmm. um, and what I know is that shame and fear are bondage. They, all, they only bind, they do not liberate ever. And so any place you have shame or fear, 
you are going to be in bondage. You are not going to experience freedom. And this is really one of the places that we hold a lot of bondage that we're not talking enough about is in our sexual practices, especially with bottoming as men. Mm -hmm. You know, it's so funny because I, 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 I think about my initial sexual experiences when I was, you know, first beginning to be sexual with men. And the majority of men, um, when I first became sexual, all I knew about, because the only thing that the narrative that I only got was men who were attracted to men, they only bottom. So that was, that was what I knew. So that was what I did in the beginning. And, <clears throat> but I would have this other desire to penetrate somebody, but that wasn't what I thought I was supposed to be doing, right? Mm. So it right. was just really, again, if you think about this mental, the, the mental confines of that, because here somebody is who is actually doing that, but they're doing that to me, but I'm not supposed to be doing that. This is what, you know, I'm so, so but when I began to, to, to penetrate or to top in, in our lingo, um, a lot of the people that were coming to me for my sexual experiences with married men, Mm -hmm. and you know they were um in the beginning my beginning of my journey was on the do because that was where my shame lied was in very just accepting that i was attracted to same to men but these were married men and these were men that on the on the outside nobody could tell you know nobody would ever be able to tell and their their deepest passion and deepest well deepest pleasure was to was to bottom was to receive from me right mm -hmm. and i began to see how as i began to go through my journey i began to see how many men really enjoy bottoming but the culture out here like even the ones even as i began to move from the dl and became very open with myself and open with my sexuality the people that were coming to me were supposed the supposed quote unquote you know we're going through all these terminologies but the supposed mask top onlys but when they got to me they were being penetrated right and i was learning this thing about wait a minute why is why are you this one thing over here but mm -hmm. all of our sexual experiences like all of my experiences with you i'm penetrating you now I'm a versatile person, so I've been penetrated as well, but I had so many experiences with these people who were solely top, supposedly, they were being penetrated. And I was like, wait a minute, there is this whole thing, there's this thing out here. Like shame is a real, I believe it's, 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 a, it's an entity, like it's a real thing. Because it is, I mean, this was, here you are getting a lot of pleasure from this but you wouldn't dare, dare mm. verbally. And when you had a conversation with me, that this is another thing, half of these guys, when they first talked to me, when they first approached me, I'm top, I don't bottom, I don't, I don't even do that. This is out of your mouth, right? But when we get to the bedroom, mm. it's a different, it's a whole different experience. Mm. And I was like, oh, we have, there's a lot of shame around owning what I get pleasure around and what mm -hmm. brings me joy. And mm -hmm. if it's not the socially acceptable thing and bottoming mm -hmm. is not socially acceptable because we are, like you said, we have to unpack this because what it is, is it's like bottoming is not the socially acceptable thing, not just because it's feminine, but if you unpack that thought, if you really go deeper into that, what you're saying is women are not acceptable. Anything about a woman is not acceptable, mm -hmm. period. Mm -hmm. Not just in a man, right. Right. but women as a whole yeah. are not like, this is woman hate. Yeah. And so it's, that's mm -hmm. another, but it's, it's a whole thing, just the, even the idea of it. And so you said, um, I wanted to bring in something that you say here because as we're talking about this, because this is about our, you know, healing our, doing the work of healing the ideas we have around our sex practices. Um, and mm -hmm. that is like, you said this thing in the article, and again, this is one of those quotes where I was like, whoa, uh. <laughs> you said, if in my solitude, 
I cannot confront personal shame about my body and my sexual expression, then my self-professed pride and advocacy amount to little more than activist theater. Mm -hmm. I meant that. I meant that. And it's not to suggest that I have to be this paragon of perfected self-acceptance. It does mean that, you know, to, to what end am I, to what, what is the quality of um, liberation and, and freedom and self-determination? What is this, if, if I'm presenting this, if I'm, what am I fighting for? How disingenuous is that if I am not at least fully, and again, it's not a plateau to be reached, but if I'm not fully invested in that struggle, if I already know, and I do know, and I share that, and I, I support people where they are, um, and so that, um, you know, so wherever they are in terms of their, their, their level of, of, of self-acceptance and self-realization, that there's a place for you to go. There's work for you to do. And it is possible. It is possible that you can live your life differently. I'm constantly uh, through my work and just sometimes just everyday conversations, you know, over brunch. My friends and I um, are affirming and supporting each other around our, our respective possibilities um, for growth and, and greater joy. How is that if, if I am not wrestling with that? Uh, and so here's an example you talked about earlier and, and quite, uh, quite brilliantly, this ongoing work that we do, that it doesn't stop when we say to the person who we may have feared most uh, knowing, <laughs> Uh, about ourselves, about our hidden selves, our shame selves. I'm gay. Doesn't that's that's the beginning? That is one. Uh, that's not actually the beginning, but it is the beginning. It's an early point. With whether that's um, with accepting, I'll, I'll I'll just speak to two dimensions: um, my sexual or sexuality, sexual orientation, and my HIV disease. And here's an example. I was at a place where I am disclosing um, my HIV status in classes and presentations that I'm doing when I'm working in Aid Atlanta. And it's on a typical work day where I'm meeting friends, I met friends for dinner. And I had my meds in my bag, my meds that help keep me alive, keep me on the planet. The same meds that I'm teaching other people about um, and, uh, and about you know, having uh, informed uh, relationships uh, with their, their health healthcare providers. Jerome, I reach into my bag and I'm discreetly trying to manage the meds. I'm closeted about taking the meds, Jerome. You know, by that point, people are nicknaming me, oh, child, that's Miss Age, you know, she got, you know, um, but here I am. So there are several points in my life where I'm, where I recognize that dissonance, like this is not a line, this is not who I say that I am. And I forced myself, as in forced myself past anxiety, to put the damn bottle on the table, because this is also who I am. And it's not, my friends are fine with it, right? So it's not, I'm, I'm hiding this because my friends will shame me. No, that's my shame. That's still there. And one of the ways in which I uh, work through that, that I break it up uh, and, and cleanse myself of it, or at least reckon with it, is do the very thing, is actually act upon the very thing that my shame is telling me, you can't do this. You're not supposed to do this. If you do this, this means this. Well, no. How do I counter that? By doing the, doing the thing. And so that is, a, that is an ongoing, that's ongoing work for us. That's ongoing work for me. I am uh, 61 now. And so uh, there's another layer in terms of just, you know, we acquire these, these layers, right? Like trees, we acquire these rings um, around experience and wisdom, but also ways in which we are rendered vulnerable in different ways. So I think about that. Well, just last week, shit, I was 35, what, what, <laughs> what happened? 
But here I am, and that's 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 a place of power for me. But there's also a certain um, vulnerability around that. There's another kind of reckoning that um, I wasn't it, it, I wasn't pressed necessarily to take on. Um, that has, has more urgency, and so I'm doing that. You know, and and I also incorporate more and more of that into my work. Um, meaning what that means for me, uh, how significant it is for me to um, be able to go to a club like Mix, which is where I was getting my life off of um, uh, the, the music and ministry of DJ Cedric. Come on, DJ Cedric. <laughs> what it means for me to still be physically able uh, to get on that floor. Um, mm. Mm. Yeah. And what just hit me was, um, and that's a function of my age too, uh, is that there are people that are my age um, that, are not, that are not here to do that. Um, and I carry them with me, right? And um, uh, these are people that, with whom I shared those early experiences um, and with whom, I got a sense of, or I experienced the divine on the dance floor and I experienced connection and affirmation. And so it's not, it's something about being older is that there's certain, if you're, if you're aging consciously, I would say, and aging not fearlessly, but as, you know, Sister Audrey suggests using strength in the service of uh, uh, one's vision. Um, and so the fear becoming less and less important that I confront it. And so what does that mean when I'm dancing and I'm dancing my ass off and when I walk off, cause that happened. There was a point where I walked away from the floor and my legs were, weren't buckling, but there was a attention. And so I'm thinking is that because I'm aging? Okay, probably, I don't know. Um, and I thought about, you know, I had this sort of, <laughs> you know, meta point where I'm kind of observing myself having some anxiety about being perceived as older man walking off the floor mm-hmm. and the effects of, you know, their, the, you know, the physical activity, how visible is that? And even in that, that's that very fleeting moment it was very important for me to kind of just turn that and say, okay, well, maybe it is. I'm not going to carry it. <laughs> like, I'm not going to, I'm not going to hold on to that. I'm going, I'm going to be that. Cause you know what? In about five minutes, he's going to play something else and I'm going to get on that floor. And if I can't, it's okay. You know? And so that's, it's all, it's part of that, you know, it's from the, 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 the same root. So yeah, I just I just you said I want to I want to touch on something. Thank you for sharing that, by the way. Um, mm-hmm. I want to touch on something you said there, which you were talking about um, the, the 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 shame and it, that how it lives in the dark places. We try to keep it in the dark, which you were talking about your pills on the table, and I can mm-hmm. totally relate to that. And what I have learned and what I, what I teach, what, I, what I've learned in my own journey around healing shame, that healing shame was a big part of my healing journey, period. So yeah. mm-hmm. I learned a lot about shame, which is why I want you to come here and talk and speak about this. But the thing about shame is that the way to heal shame is you have to bring it to the light because shame yeah. <laughs> needs a secret. It needs a secret to survive. It cannot survive if, you, if it's in the light. And the reason why we have shame and we keep things in the dark is because if it, it that thing that we are ashamed of, of the message that we hold is this makes me unlovable. Mm-hmm. I can't mm-hmm. have this and be loved at the same time. Mm-hmm. This and love cannot exist in the same space. But mm-hmm. and so the fear is, and it's 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 a legitimate fear. It's a fear we have as it's our greatest fear as children, is that if I reveal this, I will not be loved. Well, why that's so afraid? Because as kids, when we're not loved, that means death. 
because love is yes. what we need, right? So mm -hmm. it's literally, a, it feels like dying. Like that, mm -hmm. we have a shame and you're thinking about revealing it. It literally feels like I'm about to die if I do this. Mm -hmm. But what you find out when you, when I brought my things to the light that I have been shamed of, and I, I, my God, I remember very, there's a lot like, for instance, you were talking about the pills. One of the things I remember for me, uh, as well as the pills was I have this scar here and I would never show it. I would always wear long sleeve shirts. I would never show it because my thing was if there was an imperfection in my body, I won't be attractive. I won't be yeah. lovable. So, but the thing that you find, so it took me years. I would hide it. I would wear a long sleeve shirt. You would never see my arm unless you were very, very close to me. And one of the things I've, I discovered when, um, I revealed this as well as I revealed every anything I've ever revealed that I've been ashamed about, uh, as, especially speaking about sex and what I enjoy sexually, is you fear that people will will withdraw from you, that they will they love will be withheld from you. But when you bring your stuff to the light, what you find is that not only are you not going to die but that you will finally be loved. Mm -hmm. You will really you be will. loved for that. Mm -hmm. Like, because true love means all of me belongs. All of me belongs, mm -hmm. not pieces, yeah, not parts. Yeah, yeah. All of me belongs. Yeah. But you don't find that out until you bring mm -hmm. every piece to the, to the light and you bring it to the table and then the light shows you Oh yeah, this is where this belongs. I love mm -hmm. you. This is beautiful. So, like with my arm, when people see it now, and, and what I what I was so afraid of was they would find me unattractive or they would make a big deal of it. But now when people see it, it's I've heard people say, Oh my God, that's beautiful. Yeah. Oh my God, how did you have that? That is such a beautiful thing. Something that I never in my wildest dreams thought was going to happen back then. Right, right. And so this is the thing which shame keeps us from being what we don't understand, what we're not taught is shame keeps us from being loved. Mm -hmm. it's, it's the most insidious lie that we're taught to carry about ourselves. The most insidious lie that I'm not worthy. And so we surrender to conditions. And to, far too many of us are, are, uh, are in, well, all of us, um, you know, in terms of just the community at large, but certainly even in terms of our families of our origin, uh, we find ourselves in these unspoken, unwritten, but understood contracts around um, our acceptance. So I'll be okay. I'll avoid punishment or rejection. I'll enjoy some conditional, conditional acceptance, which is false, certainly, um, that's conditioned upon the, my performance as normal, mm. my approximating normalcy. And unfortunately for too many um, queer men, we, <sighs> We import that, or we, or we carry that, and then we queer it, so to speak. We replicate it with, you know, and, and adapt it to our own culture. And so we find ways of, you know, again, replicating that, that shaming within our own community to the point where we don't need straight men or some homophobic gay basher uh, to do it. We'll do our own bashing. So our shame not only uh, harms us or you know, individually, not only has that uh, individual uh, trauma, uh, we in turn engage in that, uh, that what, what, what some activists refer to as horizontal hostility in terms of training that, that shaming and that judgment upon each other. Um, and so the healing again is about calling that out, as you mentioned, in terms of shame. Uh, I was really concerned about, uh, and still, am, I, I don't know if anyone's doing, I wonder if anyone's doing any work. And, I'm, and I, I imagine that, that you've been thinking about this. I don't know yet if you've had public dialogue around this, but the impact on COVID 
uh, and black, and I'll say our black LGBTQ community, period, at, at large. Um, but given the critical importance, our, our, our vulnerability around um, uh, connection, um, our need for affirmation as part of our continued healing um, and the threat of isolation of being disconnected from each other. Um, what are we relegated to? All right. You know, if we have families or we're in spaces, um, I think about, you know, our, our el elders, people that are uh, 10, 20 years older than me, um, who may be in assisted living facilities. Um, to what extent is it, you know, is it safe, much less rewarding or affirming to be them, their full selves? Um, and what is the impact where they're cut off? Um, uh, a good um, and brilliant young brother, Justin Smith, wrote a, a piece about um, the impact and particularly uh, our reaction to our, our, what we do in terms of adapting to that, that, that altered reality and still finding ways to congregate and the risk um, and the, the impact, as well as um, the implications for those who make money uh, off of uh, developing the, or, or producing these parties, uh, running these clubs, um, and our judgment around that. You know, he's, he's, he's countering that or juxtaposing that with our need for connection. Brilliant piece. Um, and I, I, again, so it, it makes me wonder about, I, I'm, one of the reasons why I'm happy just in addition to this, as uh, our own um, healing and um, uh, safety uh, from this dreadful epidemic, you know, moving to a different place uh, and, improved, and improved health outcomes is that, you know, we get to us, family, <laughs> as, as Black queer family get to reconnect again. There's a, the, 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 uh, there's a, a ritual um, event uh, that happens in spring, in the spring, the indigenous uh, house music party at Piedmont Park. I know that's gonna be major. I know that because last year we didn't have, we were deprived of it. And that is yet another example, right? And, and through music and culture that we get to experience family and, and be with each other. Um, and those, those opportunities are so precious to us. Um, I'm, I'm wondering, and I want to hear are the ways in which uh, there, are, there is public dialogue around the sh sexual shame. What are, are, what are some other spaces? And if you have some ideas about how to make that more accessible, because what I'd love uh, to hear, and I, and I got some of it from some of the reactions from uh, this, this article um, that people were saying that I didn't, I never, there was something, there was something that you raised that I never considered. Mm -hmm. uh, and some people that identified in terms of whatever sexual positioning they, and practices they enjoy and what it meant for them. You know, I want that, that open because I imagine there is such untreated uh, shame. There's just wells of it, right? And so how do we provide the opportunity for people, the safety for people to just say it? You know, I'm, this is... <laughs> it's so beautiful that you're that you're raising this. Um, this is one something I've been thinking about um, myself because mm -hmm. you don't heal in isolation. You heal in community. Yes. There are parts. Mm -hmm. There are parts of your healing process you are going to have to do. Um, I think one of my favorite quotes is, um, "No one can heal alone, mm -hmm. although you always have to heal by yourself." So. Mm -hmm you have to do the healing work you have to do it but you can't do it alone mm -hmm. and like where's the space like i was this is my like you have to do this work in your own private home but then you need to be able to do this in public and what i mean by that is can you put your hand on your heart and say i enjoy being penetrated like and mm -hmm. how does that feel in the body 
like and notice what comes mm -hmm. up in your body when you say that I enjoy being mm -hmm. penetrated and I am enough there is nothing wrong with me mm -hmm. right mm -hmm. to say this to the self first right and not and then not and to not have to immediately go to because again I told you before I'm versatile I enjoy both but not to immediately have to say, and I enjoy, yes. can I just yes. own, own this piece of it? Mm -hmm. Let me just own this and bring this to the light. I enjoy being penetrated. Mm -hmm. I am enough. There's nothing wrong with me. And then can you be, okay, so why I said this for, for long, because part of the healing is you have to get it consciously in your body, but it also needs to be witnessed. Mm -hmm. So mm. can you... Is there a like I know of a community where we can do this, but it's funny you brought this up. I'll share this in a minute because I don't think we've ever done this and this conversation in this community. But to stand in front of your brothers, people that look like you and people you're attracted to, this is very important too. People yeah. that you may yeah. be attracted to, and that's, like that's a risk. That's stand, a risk. This is the risk. Yeah, again, the risk. this is the right. bringing the light. You have to bring yeah. it to the light where you feel like you may right. die, so that you can recognize right. that you'll be loved. If right. the bring and say. I enjoy being penetrated and I'm enough and there's nothing wrong with me as brothers stand yeah. around you in a circle. Right. And so I'm in an organization that, so one, this needs to happen. This is the healing work. This is healing work for anyone, whether you're same gender loving or black or whatever. If you have shame, you got to do it personally first. You got to ground it in there, but then it also needs to be witnessed. Yeah. It has to be witnessed. And so yeah. I'm in an organization called the Dota. You may have heard of it, um, but they do a yes. lot of. I thought that's what you were going to Yeah, so you know, I'm in this organization. I joined it a few years ago, and I've led a lot of workshops and things for them, um, but around you know healing work and things like this. But as you said, this I don't know of, and this is something I've had in conversation with my my friends in private. Mm -hmm. Is I mm -hmm. don't really know of spaces where brothers can go or brother let me actually speak specifically to what i'm talking about where brothers black men can go black men who are attracted to black men can go to heal specifically their their shame and their sexuality especially I, if adoti helps you heal your shame around being attracted to the same gender right your sexuality what this mm -hmm. is about is like, and I think that is a important step and that's the foundation. But once you get that foundation, your real liberation is gonna come when you heal your shame around your sexual behavior, like your sexual practices. And I don't know, I don't, I've, I don't know of work, that if I personally don't, I'm not saying it doesn't exist, but I don't know of work out there that's done for black men to heal, again, where you could go and say, where this masculine expressing man from all who's telling you he is a who telling you he is a dominant only top who mm -hmm. actually gets penetrated where can he go to heal to release that shame mm -hmm. that penetration is is not it doesn't make me less than mm -hmm. and i am worthy because the other piece is, is less than but also i got to i got to know that i am worthy okay. of receiving what brings me joy yeah. And owning it's, this brings me joy. Yeah. I can receive what brings me joy without having to prove myself worthy of it, without having to do anything. Mm -hmm. I can just receive. I mm -hmm. can receive my pleasure the way I want to receive it. Mm -hmm. And I don't and it know. Doesn't make, yeah. Go ahead. It doesn't make me any lesser of a man. And it doesn't matter what and the part of that that freeing up is about resisting the gaze g g a z e um the uh patriarchal gaze the the white gaze of the uh cisgender gaze in terms of masculinity and gender performance um the gaze of my my parents and my community and whoever whoever reinforced these messages that they were led to to follow because <laughs> they didn't they didn't they didn't develop it they didn't create 
investigate it. They just pass it on based on what they knew. <laughs> and that gauge but, shows up in so many, mm -hmm. like, because yeah. you, you, you said this in the article, and I wanted to bring this up because I have just two more things I wanted to talk to you about because I know I've been over time mm -hmm. with you, but um, you brought this up in your article as you're talking about the gaze, again, G-A-Z, and how mm -hmm. that shows up in our own, how that becomes internalized. When you were talking mm -hmm. about like, I'm actually read it word for word. You say, men don't express shame by admitting, I feel bottoms are, are not real men because I am afraid of my feminine self. Mm -hmm. Shame sounds more like, why are there so many bottoms in Atlanta? Or mm -hmm. why do bottoms want to be treated like women? And that's the, that's the gaze that has become internalized mm -hmm. that we're using that keeps us from that literally keeps us from being whole. Yeah, yeah. Because, and, and it, it, go ahead, go ahead. No, no, go ahead, go ahead. No, I, go ahead. Um, uh, it, 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 it creases my heart, you know, when, when I see that, because I know that there are people that are reading that or hearing that message. And I wonder when I see these comments, and most often on social media, uh, I certainly have seen them uh, in Jack, when, when I had a Jack account. One of the reasons why I let go of my Jack account uh, was because of just the level of negativity. And I just didn't want, and it's not about, you know, yeah. <laughs> I had some great experiences, great experiences from Jack. And then not so great, you know, in terms of the, the people that I actually uh, had, had sexual encounters with and just what I witnessed. So some of the exchange that didn't um, result in, you know, a sexual connection, um, just a lot of negativity. Uh, hmm. It's such a, a broad area. So this is not limited to, it's not, hmm. this applies to, and we're susceptible to it regardless of age, level of masculinity, um, HIV status. Uh, uh, and certainly I think there's, there's, there's a piece of this, you know, most, uh, whether or not um, men who identify as straight do to whatever extent they may um, engage in bottoming. Um, regardless of identity, this is a, such an issue around um, having, uh, uh, the access to our own humanity, access to um, uh, really fulfilling our destiny. So I want to go circle back to the podcast that you uh, that I was sharing with you that I, your your podcast in terms of recognizing our purpose. And this is such a this for many um, black gay and same sex attracted men. This this is. Uh, at the root of that barrier to just being whole, you know, that's it's, it makes it so much harder to just be self-loving and 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 being fulfilled, because we're still operating under that old contract. You know, there's still that same fear. So you mentioned the shame being connected to when we're when we're children, if 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 our parents find out about us and find out our truth, that they won't love us. And that connection to being unloved, sense of being unloved is akin to, and yes, that makes sense. It's a survival <laughs> instinct. Um, it's part of why, <laughs> why our parents are, are driven to keep us alive, right? <laughs> and care for us in that very fundamental, concrete way. That fear death manifests, we carry that. And I think it's 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 on the same level. And because we grow up and we we develop into this adult lives and you know and this and, and our grown up bodies and our grown up responsibilities, we think that we have outgrown that. We fool ourselves. We're fooled to believing that we don't have that need and that fear, that that dire um, essential need to be loved. That that is also still connected to our survival and to the, and to whatever uh, degree we don't believe that we will be loved or judged as worthy is a death. And the read is that the irony is when we live under that, that cloak of fear, under that 
that repression, that condition of living is a form of death or it's certainly a non-life, right? Um, so on one hand, you're fearing death, but you're not living life. So what, where are you? Um, and I don't mean that in terms of, of, of a physical death, but I do mean it in terms of there is a, a, an emotional and spiritual deadening mm. um, that we endure, that, that we withstand. And yeah, I, I'm, I'm excited about this conversation. I, and I, I hope that it, it inspires us, you and I, uh, and others who watch it to see what we can do. What, what are the models? What are the positive um, examples of uh, living freely? What are the, the, the resources, the adotes? Um, how do we share that, that, that wealth of uh, emotional, mental, physical, mind, body, and spirit restoration as black, gay, and same-sex same sex attracted men? Um, I'm uh, a part of this, an organization called uh, Thrive SS um, that's based in Atlanta, but has a uh, national uh, range. Um, and it is an advocacy organization for black, uh, gay, and other uh, same-sex attracted men who are living with HIV. And one of the many uh, wonderful things that they do is uh, uh, they develop programming around older uh, black gay men, the Silver Lining Project, um, which I love um, because again, that is yet another um, piece of the work and that is uh, not ignoring, uh, prioritizing the needs of our elders, of which I am, <laughs> I, I also identify. Um, so that again, we are assured some level of, of connection. Mm. Um, so I think about organizations like Thrives and, and Counter Narrative Project and certainly your work. Um, and uh, how do we, again, really, uh, there's, a, there's a specific focus around, as you mentioned, the healing um, and embracing our, our sexuality as black men that um, is so necessary for us. So yeah. I'm, I'm down. <laughs> we will be in conversation um, after this, <laughs> as I'm sure, since I have ideas. Oh, um, so um, this is my last question we... for you before we close. Okay, are um, we gonna talk about the ass is pussy at some point? That was exactly <laughs> the question I was getting to. <laughs> oh, we got to talk about pussy, Jerome. You are right on, on time, my friend. You are right on time. So I have, I had to, I was like, I cannot let him go if we do not talk about this. So okay. as we're talking, we've been talking about liberation and we've been talking about, you know, being affirming and getting your wholeness. And I know this mm -hmm. is a huge part if you are engaging with sex with another man, especially a man who may be, um, let's just say another man, especially, uh, well, actually, especially if you're, if the man is more masculine expressing or he has a thug yeah. past or anything like that, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. This is a part of that happens in our sexual expression where, yeah. where men may call mm -hmm. your ass pussy during mm -hmm. the sexual thing. And you write about this that I, <laughs> I need to, I'm going to read it because again, I don't want to paraphrase because your words right here and then we got to jump into this. So you say, I, I yeah. understood. So this is, you're talking about during the sexual experience, mm -hmm. the guy began to call your ass a pussy and you had, mm -hmm. you began to kind of bristle at first, but then you had this thing. You say, yeah. I understood that if his name for the flesh that facilitates joy was pussy, then I could serve him some hot ass pussy without reservation. So I did. And we both appreciated it with no loss of manhood. Sir, you wrote that line. You hear me? <laughs> you wrote that line. Thank you. Talk to me about this. Um, uh, you know, um, there are points, some of the most important and uh, really impactful, essential moments of growth 
are just unplanned, you know? Uh, and so it's one of those points where, <laughs> what it reminds me, is a different take on the song. Um, uh, what's that Diana says, uh, Queen Diana in the boss, fancy me, thought I had my degree. And what I mean by that is that I thought that I had reached a certain level of sophistication and again, acceptance and, um, you know, working through my femme phobia. And this guy was just emphatically, and it, you know, he was into it, we were into it. And he was like, some good ass pussy, you know, that's how he said it. And so it was with gusto. And so the verb, it wasn't just that he said it, he said it, the, 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 the pleasure, his pleasure was resonating, you know, in his, his utterance. Um, and at the same time, now I didn't do like we in the midst of doing it. So I'm not, you know, I'm not necessarily mind, you know, thinking, searching for Joseph Beam, um, Essex Hemphill, Marlon Riggs quotes <laughs> to make this experience all right. You know, I carry those brothers, Asanto, all of them, carry them with me. But, you know, we weren't communing right at that point. <laughs> Or maybe we were, but if anything, they're probably telling me, child, get your life. <laughs> so they actually might have been channeling, as it were, given where I arrived. You know, maybe they helped, you know, get me there. But, but it was, I was like, mm. there was a point where in that moment, just I instinctively said, let that go. Let it go. Like, and I, I guess the most that I could think in oh, with that mind was, I'll deal with it later. I'm going to get into it. And it, it heightened the pleasure. And there was something about, so you talk about shame. Um, something about the embracing of it, even though I had shame around it, 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 it lifted it. And so the next time it came up, it still, it wasn't just every, with every subsequent, you know, occurrence where, someone referred to my ass as a pussy, that I didn't have some tinge, some anxiety, but it was, it was, it, it, it had lessened. And I knew that I was working through it. Um, and so just by confronting that, and yeah. Um, and that's not, the, the goal is not, of course, you know, and I'm, you know, when you write something, you just had to, you know, release it. So, cause sometimes you'll say, oh, Jerome, and I know you, you, I assume you may struggle with this. When I say this particular, Particularly when it's critique about some um, uh, our black gay men's negative or harmful attitudes that it's read that I'm somehow suggesting only black men do this mm -hmm. or that white men don't do it as much as black men. So that's one thing. That's one consideration. And then I say, well, I think I've made myself clear, you know, because for me, yeah, that's I, I, I know that, you know, white men struggle with some of the same stuff, but that's not, uh, white men are not as, as important to me, quite frankly, um, as a collective. And so I'm not writing about <laughs> white men. So that's one. Um, in this instance, in terms of that particular piece about um, ass as pussy, I was hoping that readers didn't suggest that this is where you should, be, that you should be okay with it. If you have reservations about that, some people just don't dig it. If anything, I would say, so at some point in your quiet moment, just as you mentioned before, when you were talking about, you know, placing your hand on your heart and speaking to that self, that it may be that you consider what it is about that that causes you, that, that it makes it objectionable. That's for your exploration. I think that's the personal exploration. I, I, I highly recommend that around this and other aspects of, of just being, right, just being black and gay and male is to get in touch with what is it um, what is it that you're feeling when you when you actually assert this aspect of who you are or this practice this this thing that you do that expresses who, who you are regardless of who's watching you know um, so yeah that was that was uh, quite um, freeing for me yeah. I just, uh, 
Thank you for that mm -hmm. section. One, because mm -hmm. again, I saw myself in so many of that. I had have I've had reservations with that for myself, and I was looking at it, and it made me think, oh. Mm -hmm. What is your reservation really about? And again, the line that really got me was like, yeah. this, this is facilitating joy for him, right? This is not a domination type of, this is he mm -hmm. is experiencing joy and this is how he's experiencing it. Can I experience mm -hmm. it as well? Mm -hmm. Because, and again, I think my, when I looked at it, my, law, my, 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 my rejection of it was it was a loss mm -hmm. of manhood. Yeah, as you said, and as you were saying this piece, it was like, oh wait, there's no. Again, as you said in the whole piece, whatever, wherever I receive pleasure, there is no loss of myself. This is a thing. This is an aha moment, probably for people, because this is kind of a deeper spiritual lesson. Wherever you are receiving pleasure, you are receiving joy. There is no loss of yourself. There is only an addition of yourself. Yes, yes. Because joy it's a, it's a, adds pieces of you back into you. It does not yeah. take it away. So yeah. if you are experiencing joy, I have not lost any aspect of myself. I have gained it. It is life-giving. It is life-giving. It's what saves you. It's what heals you. It's what buffers you from the everyday bullshit that you have to deal with. And that's another thing. I, 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 I referenced that when I was talking about uh, bottoming as a revolutionary act is that our sexuality in the context of our own our individual experience and then our engagement with one another and just reminding ourselves that we are worthy so in using the construct that you had mentioned earlier we are worthy of receiving we are worthy of giving then appreciate we are worthy of having our receiving received, right? Our receiving received and, and thus um, giving pleasure as well. Giving and getting it, you know? Um, and that is so that, and we can't do it for ourselves. I'll just, I'll leave you with one quote and I can't, the person who said it, and I know who said it, and I can't reveal it. <laughs> but um, he said, this ass will not fuck itself. This ass will not fuck itself. And what, we've never had a full conversation about it, but I do believe it harkens to, um, again, the, the sexual healing and the need for support in that, you know, it's about the need of love. I connect that with the need for love and the need for connection. What is it? So if, if, if this ass will not fuck itself, then I need somebody. And what is that need about? And what does what does fucking itself facilitate? Or what can it facilitate? And what do we bring to that act? You know? So um, what do we bring to that act? And what do we bring to the assessment, the valuation of it? And that's where we exercise that, that resistance, right? The revolution comes when we can say, I know what so-and-so, or even some of my, my Judy's have said about this act. This is what this act is going to mean for me. This is what it's going to mean for, um, you know, when when uh, Marvell was back there um, calling my ass a pussy. I know what my ass is. I know it's not a, a, a literal pussy or vagina, um, but I get to set the terms. It's my body. And if the terms are mutually respectful, let's play. Let's play. Let's give ourselves room to play. Let's Let's have fun again. Um, yeah. Mm. I think that's a perfect place to end, my friend. That, thank you in a thousand different ways uh, for this. Oh, thank you. And for this beautiful article, all of you all, please read it. I'll leave the link to it underneath this video. Um, but I want to close with just one last quote from you from this article, and then that will be the last words in this interview. You say, when Black gay men's sexual practices foster intimacy, establish healthy bonds as casual sex mates, friendships, and or life partners outside of compulsory heterosexual standards, when Black queer sexuality relieves Black queer anguish, or buffers against cultural and political aggressions, 
our fucking functions in a revolutionary fashion. Thank you as always. Thank you all for watching. Thank you. I love you. Now go love yourselves. <laughs>